like to say a great welcome to everyone to our, our next um, online event. Um, welcome from the um, Anglia Ruskin um, Cyber Security and Networking Research Group, um, OWAS Cambridge, BCS um, Cybercrime Forensics, and the BCS Hampshire Groups. Um, thank you for everyone for attending. Um, I would like to introduce um, uh, my erstwhile colleague from the University of Greenwich, um, Damola. Uh, Lawal, hopefully, <laughs> uh, Damola is going to be presenting um, uh, an interesting topic tonight. Are we preparing our students for world um, digital forensics? And the subtitle, how reliable are current forensic processes in combating the illegal use of portable programmable devices? I think you'll, you'll agree we're in for a very interesting talk this evening. Um, we will take uh, questions in the chat box, so the question box, um, after we go through and we'll do them at the end um and i would like to remind everyone about the bcs competitions that we're currently running and again i'll post details um in the chat as we go through the evening uh and thank you everyone for attending uh damola over to yourself thank you very much thank you very much adrian thank you margaret and thank you everyone for joining today um my name is damola Lawal and um, I'm a digital forensics and law researcher. Um, just like Adrian said, I'll be talking today on teaching um, students digital forensics and if we are prepared, preparing our students for real world digital forensics. Um, there are lots of things to consider when it comes to investigation of digital evidence. And um, today, to buttress my point, I'll be using as a proof of concept um, hardware attacks or port portable programming devices, which is kind of my area of research at the moment, and how reliable are the current digital forensic processes, um, including tools, analysts, um, ETC, in combating the illegal use of portable programmable devices, and um, to see the potential of them leading to miscarriages of justice. Um, just a brief background. Um, so digital forensics is considered a crime investigation tool in some cases an audit tool, but it's a tool that is also prone to errors. And these errors could come from the analyst, it could be errors in the tools, in, in the software, or you know, even just the bias that might have been um, put in the mind of the investigator prior to starting the investigation or commencing the investigation. Um, but it's a tool that is not without fault. It's a tool that is not without errors by itself. And um, sometimes digital forensics analysts are invited to the court to come and testify um, on what they saw, to come and give expert testimony in the court. And the expert testimony in the court is usually based on the conclusions drawn from the first phase. So I'm gonna be using my cursor to um, indicate or I'm talking about the site and I'm talking about. And um, Errors in this stage, the digital forensics phase, could lead to errors in the expert testimony phase because the testimony here is based off or based on the conclusions conclusions drawn in the digital forensics investigation phase, and based off or based on the errors in the expert testimony phase, there could be errors in the decision making phase as well, where they um, sentence or prosecute the person, and um, that if there are errors in the digital forensics phase which could potentially lead to errors in the expert testimony phase, this could ultimately lead to a miscarriage of justice in the case decision phase where a, an innocent person is wrongly prosecuted for a, a crime they know nothing about. So an innocent person or a guilty person rather is let go for something they've actually done. And um, there is no limit to the imagination of what um, a guilty person who is let back into the street can return to doing on the street. So I tell students many times, or um, other forensic analysts that I've been privileged to talk to, that your work doesn't just stop at um, investigating um, tools or investigating evidence, rather, or just using the information, the tools I've provided to you to you know, write a con conclusion and then just report and drop something back to the person who's giving you the case. So your, your conclusion could, or your testimony could literally end someone's life or could contribute to the end of someone's life or to the second chance of a criminal and um, yeah basically 
wrong decision making which could lead to endangering the society or even loss of life of innocent people and there are some real life cases which are also going to see where innocent people have been wrongly prosecuted for crimes they know nothing of because of errors in the digital forensics um, process yeah just like i said miscarriage of justice is literally basically prosecuting an innocent person or letting a guilty person walk free now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be using hardware attacks or portable programmable devices as a proof of concept. Um, how you know something else or someone else could be responsible for um, artifacts generated or artifacts found um, during investigation, but the analyst thinks the user of the system must be responsible, and they write or draw their conclusion based off that. No matter how erroneous that is, it is still a credible report because they've written what they found. So they would not be lying, they would be saying something they really found. And that report, even though it's erroneous, would still be considered credible, even in the court of law. And um, that erroneous report, which is credible, could lead to a wrongful um, prosecution of an innocent person or you know, acquittal of a guilty person. So the reason why um, I came up with this, um, what, how this idea came up um, of hardware research is, um, coming from my experience of penetration testing, I've used some of these devices in um, penetration tests. And because of my knowledge in digital forensics as well, it occurred to me it's possible for these devices to actually, you know, be used to frame up an innocent person because they can control or operate a computer like a human and the computer literally just trusts every input coming from those devices because it assumes it's the user who is sending the instructions. And, um, Hardware attacks like this are usually more successful than software attacks because um, there's not many solutions out there yet as much as software solutions to prevent um, hardware attacks. So there are lots of solutions to prevent software attacks. We've got the intrusion detection systems, the intrusion prevention systems, we've got firewalls, we've got um, antiviruses and so on that can pre prevent um, software attacks or recognize patterns of um, or signatures of um, attacks and block those malware, block the viruses before they cause harm to a system or to a target. However, in the case of hardware attacks, um, there is not much um, on securing or protecting hardware yet. There's not much on hardware security yet. So attackers are also finding this um, gap very, very interesting and attractive to exploit. And um, among the devices, um, used most of the devices identify um, as heats when they are connected to the system or let me say the machine or the computer detects them as human interface devices heats heats are basically just um, devices you use to interact with your system they include mouse the keyboard joystick gamepad um, and so on and um, the, the input from these devices are usually trusted by the computer because the computer assumes it's the user, it's my owner who is controlling me, it's the user who must be sending these instructions to me. However, it is this trust that the um, portable programming devices take advantage of, and they are abusing to carry out the illegal um, actions or the unauthorized actions on the system. Um, these are some of them. Um, we've got the Bashman and the Shark Jack, the rubber ducky, which I'm sure, or I believe many people here may be familiar with, but there are lots of other ones. And the uh, interesting part of this also is that you can make yours for less than $4. It's just a matter of you knowing where to buy the hardware and knowing where to download the firmware, and you're good to go. Um, so it's becoming more dangerous. It's becoming easier to access. And um, there is a huge need for um, investigators, not just you know, the hackers or penetration testers now to be aware, but also for digital forensic analysts to be aware. So this is just one of those means through which um, I'm proving this concept of how um, something else or someone else could be responsible for unauthorized actions or illegal um, actions on a computer while the analyst is, you know, thinks, the analyst thinks the user or the suspect is responsible. And um, the screen crab there is not considered a heat because it uses the HDMI interface for its own operations. So that would not be considered a heat. Um, just to point again, this is the screen crab. I hope we can see my cursor. 
So um, this would not be considered a human interface device. It doesn't identify um, as a heat. And uh, we're going to look at the experiment I carried out with this one later on and then talk about the results. Um, for the experiments I've carried out so far, um, I've used the rubber ducky for a framing attack. There's a published paper on it. I've used the OMG for a file tampering attack. There's a published paper on it. I've used the screen crack also for uh, an attack. I'm going to show um, how they all fit in and work together and how and why the screen crack also falls into uh, this category of portable programmable devices. I've used the screen crack for reconnaissance um, for one of the attacks, and I'm going to show the, the experiment set up very soon. The bash bunny is what I intend to use for the next experiment, and it is a very interesting one because it can identify itself as not just the heat, but um, it can also work through the LAN. Um, the, the system can detect it as a LAN um, interface, basically. And um, it can use that to collect information from the system, even some information from the system, even while the system is locked without the need for a password. Um, so just to show the stages of the attack with PPD. So um, PPD, PPD simply means portable program devices, which I've been mentioning um, since. So the PPD attack phases, I simplified this or broke them down into three which is the first one reconnaissance, the second one arming and exploit, and the third one attack. So the reconnaissance is basically where you gather information or you do your, your footprinting um, about the target. You gather information about the target. This can be done physically through the assessment of the site, planting of recon device, which I have done because the focus of my research right now is hardware attacks. There are lots of ways through which reconnaissance can be carried out, especially for the penetration testers on here right now. Yes, there are lots of ways to which reconnaissance can be carried out, lots of OSINT tools that can be used. However, the focus of my research is hardware attacks. So I've also decided to use the hardware device for the, recon for the reconnaissance phase um, of this um, work. And um, part of the reconnaissance includes the collection of reconnaissance data, meaning um, the information you gathered, how do you retrieve it? And then you use that information in phase two, where you write the targeted payload. The thing about hardware attacks or portable programming device attacks is that um, you need to be very, um, you need to be accurate to a very reasonable extent. You need to be able to test the payload several times on a similar operating system, on a similar system, not necessarily the same hardware, but similar operating systems, similar um, window arrangement. And you need to have an idea of the target you really want to work on. Is it a file? Is it a folder? Is it a, a website? You can also use some of these dev devices to deface the website if you have access to the um, web server without you actually sitting on the computer to operate it. And um, yeah, part of the phase is also encoding of the payload, which is where you convert the payload into a binary file if you're using the rubber ducky or um, any other form of encoding that is necessary and then loading the payload onto the programmable device. So if you're using the rubber ducky, which I showed earlier as well, you need to load the binary file back into binary file back into the rubber ducky after you've encoded it before you attach on the or plug into the target machine. Now we would not be talking about delivery here because delivery is all about you know, the creativity of the attacker. There is no limit to there is no limitation on how you can deliver. That all depends on the creativity of the attacker, um, but we'll not be covering delivery here. Um, loading the payload onto the program device could also be in the case of the OMG cable, which we're also going to look at, which I used for the second experiment. The OMG cable can work um, wirelessly, can control the, it basically like a command and control, but through a LAN, a local area network, it has its own Wi Fi, it has its own web server and can literally be controlled as long as there's a good line of sight. It can be controlled from a distance. It can receive instructions from the attacker to control the system from a distance. And then the last phase is the exploit delivery, where you plug the device after you've loaded the payload, and then you, your device needs to be retrieved because, of course, you need to clear your tracks, um, or the attacker needs to clear their tracks. So for the first experiment I carried out, um, I investigated the download of indecent photographs. I did not get actual 
in these same photographs, by the way, I used emojis to represent the um, in these same photographs. And again, it was just for a proof of concept. So the aim of this first experiment was to you know, plan um, to carry out a set of actions where the user accesses illegal images from a child porn website, a fake child porn website. And um, another machine, a similar system, the same baseline, um, is a different system, a similar system rather, or with the same baseline as the first one, where the robot key is now used to carry out the same set of actions. And then to see if forensics can actually distinguish between the evidence left by the human user and the evidence left by the robot key, because you know the actions are very similar. They access the same website, they downloaded the same file, and um, they both open the file to view and to see if you know forensic tools or analysts could actually pick up um, on the fact that the user did not do this or even suspect um, that a programming device may have carried out the actions. And is there potential for miscarriage of justice, which I explained earlier again, it's basically prosecuting an innocent person or um, letting a guilty person walk free. And um, that could also be a result of errors in the digital forensics um, phase of the attack of the investigation. And it gets the errors passed onto the expert testimony phase. And then because of the error in the expert testimony phase, again, there could be error in the decision-making phase. So basically, it's the potential for miscarriage of justice from the digital forensic investigation phase. And um, this is the experimental setup. There is a target machine there, which is the machine of the potential victim. I created a LAN um, for testing this. I also created my own web server. And um, the, the code run, I, I used a LAN and created a web server myself because I needed to ensure consistency throughout my experiments. If I had used a dynamic website to let someone on the internet, the internet changes very swiftly. And we all know how quickly the internet changes. If I look at your LinkedIn profile right now and um, you realize something is wrong, you change your full stop or change your work title. If I go the next minute, I'm seeing something different. So the same with websites um, that are dynamic on the internet. So I needed to ensure consistency throughout my experiments. That was why I created a fake website myself for this purpose and used a LAN um, environment, creating my test, LAN test bed for this work, also to avoid breaching any of the computer issues apps. Um, the robot key was programmed to carry out the same set of actions. Now you're going to see how the traffic is generated. The system sends a request to the server, and the S slide is, is the child porn, the fake child porn site responds to the client with the image they've downloaded. The user opens it and views, and they close it. Um, yes. All right. So. The user can be prosecuted for the possession of child pornography if they are found guilty. That is, if, the, if digital forensics is not able to detect the use of um, this device or that detect that this device may have been responsible for the creation of the artifact. In addition, a company could potentially have rightful cause to fire an employee. So the attack I carried out here in this first experiment was a framing attack where an innocent person you know, is set up in a way or false evidence is planted on their device for malicious reasons. It could be to get them fired or a company could also have need a rightful cause to fire an employee. So in, in the UK, especially, they take wrongful termination very seriously, same with the US. Um, so for a company to have rightful cause to fire an employee sometimes, they could also you know, look for a way to set them up or frame them. So then they have evidence to prove or show that they've breached this company policy or they've actually committed a crime. That is why they've been fired. So in this case, a company could, if the user or the target is found guilty, a company could also have a rightful cause to fire the employee. Now, the results of the evidence. Um, I like to interact a lot during presentations or um, teaching or talking. So you can also drop your answers in the chat along with your questions. So I'm going to ask some questions. You can drop in the chat. Um, who can detect the difference between these two results? So there is the first column. You can see my cursor. There is the first column here. It's talking about the results from the docu actions. 
and the results from the human actions. Who can spot the difference between both of them? You can drop your answer in the chat. Um, yeah, anybody just one minute? All right, not to waste time. You can keep dropping your answers, but um, there, is no, there is no difference um, in the results. And we can also see the hash generated. They are the same in both um, scenarios. And the use of the Robada key to download the file also did not alter the hash, the file in any way, hence why the hash is still the same. So, and that's why I've got original hash of file here. And I've also got the MD5 hash after the experiment, because I wanted to see, would there actually be any form of change or any difference between um, the file in the file after it was downloaded by the Robada key or after it was downloaded by the user? And we can see here in the four fields that belong to the file um, hash, they are all the same, meaning there was no difference. And there was nothing looking unusual. I used autopsy to investigate this, corroborated using end case. And um, there is no difference in both of them. The file name is the same, downloaded. It looks like it was viewed by the user. And in the next slide, we're going to see, next two slides, we're going to see um, a much more um, interesting side of this result. Yeah, so we can see the file was accessed, uh, was created, 10 or 3 p.m. And the file was accessed 10 or 4 p.m., which was just a minute after the file was created. Now this makes it so difficult for the user to claim that they were not interested in the file, because if you're really not interested in the file, how come you've downloaded the picture just 10 or 3 p.m. and viewed it a minute afterwards? That doesn't make sense. On a normal day, it's not going to make sense, but which is why awareness of things like this need to be um, made much more, um, taken much more seriously. And um, we also see from the, art, the metadata down here that it was accessed or retrieved, gotten, downloaded from the S-Slide website. And then um, the picture you wrote shows a slide, the file was downloaded or and, and opened or viewed after download. And again, just to see there is really no difference between both of them. So now to experiment two, um, the second experiment I carried out, I used the OMG cable, which to an extent is my favorite. I used the OMG cable to perform a file tampering attack. I used this to alter a record of accounts. And um, if the, also to see if the forensic analyst or if digital forensic processes can um, detect that the change was made using the OMG cable, or it's still gonna assume that the, the suspect or the user or the person in charge of the system or the person in charge of the accounts made those changes. And um, if the person is found guilty in this case, they could be charged with a crime of fraud. And this is just a simplified um, setup of the experiment. The bigger picture will be shown when I introduce the screen crab. This was just a section of the experiment where the file tampering took place. So the OMG cable, like I said, can work wirelessly. This um, is just for demo, but this is better done in person. So I'm gonna skip this. Um, it can work as we can see something here though, however, which is there is access point mode and there is station mode. The access point mode is basically the one where is the one where the OMG cable can work wirelessly or can create its own access point for the attacker to connect to it and control it remotely basically sending instructions remotely to the target system it is attached to. And the station mode, think of it as a rubber ducky. Yeah, so it's just the OMG cable is kind of an advanced rubber ducky, but that can also work wirelessly. All right, um, the employee can be punished, fired or prosecuted if found guilty um, for fraud. And again, in this case, the company may also have rightful cause, or a colleague could also have framed the, you know, the other person because maybe they are next for a promotion, or it could be any reason whatsoever. 
they could also have been framed for things like this. And the most interesting part of these devices is you don't need to be seated on the computer to operate the system, which makes it even much um, more dangerous and less suspicious. Because as far as the suspect may be concerned, nobody else is uh, nobody else has used my computer. Nobody else was seated on my chair. Nobody else has gained access to my computer. So I don't know who else may have done this, but I have not done it. But then that makes it more, much more difficult to believe them that they, they are not responsible for the crime. So the target here, um, I just created a sample a record of accounts. And the, the target record here is Mary Gold. And the aim was to change not pay to pay and reduce the amount due, which was successfully done using the OMG cable. And the results of the um, investigation also show I've used, I've called the, the, the experiment to OMGA name here we are seeing was the name of the user, the computer user that was active on the computer. And I used this because I needed to label the, the, the computers I'm using for my experiment so I don't mix them up. I needed to label them properly. But this just replaced this with an actual username. It could be John A, it could be um, Damien, it could be Margaret, it could be anything. But basically, this is a representation of the username. So if an actual username was used to, um, it was used on the computer, it would have reflected the person's name here as the last author of the file. And um, if they are the last author and that file has been on their system, how can nobody else has access to your system? How can you say you don't know how the change was made? How can you say you don't know who authored the file? So it makes it very hard to believe them that they've not done it. It, it also makes it difficult for forensics to detect that this device, is, uh, this device was responsible. Again, if we look at this result for the file, the only difference here you're going to see is the file name, which is COM2421, great, and general contributions. They are similar files, only the contents were, were different. But they are similar files, the same extension. But um, this one was carried out, was altered by the employee, by an actual user, and this one was altered by the OMG cable. But if we look further down, there's no other difference. So the metadata shows last modified by the user. Um, there was no flag by the forensic tool, and there was no unusual file property to suggest to the forensic analyst that you know a device could have been responsible and not the user or the suspect in this case. Um, among the properties or artifacts left um, behind by the OMG cable, um, and same with the rubber ducky, by the way, it are the PID and the VID, which mean um, product ID and vendor ID. Uh, USB devices had VID and PID, um, usually unique in many cases. Um, however, there are some traces you can use to know that the OMG cable is a bit suspicious. And if you look at the rest, apart from this default, um, you know, um, attached USBs, if you look at the rest, you've got Microsoft or Logitech, basically their device make are available, right, in this column. And you can't really see anything looking to um, suspicious here because they look trusted to an extent. Well, the moment you get to this place, you can see the device make is empty. The column, the device make fields are empty. That should be a red flag or a signal to the analyst that something is up, there's something strange going on here. I can understand this and I can see the dates of creation, ETC, but if I look at this one, why are these ones also not showing the device make? Apart from that, if you look at the first sections of the PID and VID, they are, they are the same. Apart from this last bit, I hope my cursor is still visible, the MI00 and the MI01, which basically represent the keyboard installation of the OMG cable and the mouse installation of the OMG cable. So the OMG cable is able to install itself as a mouse and also as a keyboard. And um, that should also be a red flag. Apart from that, if you look at the device ID here, um, no one needs a special pair of glasses to see that there is something strange about this one having this 999 device ID amongst all of them. Um, so things like this could be a red flag. However, there is no way to accurately still tie the presence of this device to the actions carried out. It could be a signal or an indicator 
to investigate down that path, but it does not necessarily mean, um, you know, this corroborates the fact that the device is responsible. Because then, if the forensic analyst is not careful, they may be making an error again by letting a guilty person actually walk free. So yeah, we can see that the, the zero, 00 was the mouse installation of the OMG cable and the zero 01 um, version was the keyboard installation of the OMG cable. And um, if there was a unique device make, right, like maybe um, Red Thunder as the device make, for example, that would make the analyst or the investigator know, I have not come across this device make before, this manufacturer before, I need to further investigate down this path. But there is no device make, there is no unique device make to make it easier to spot or recognize or identify this device. And um, somebody just asked a question, Olga, did the rubber ducky leave the same trace? Um, the rubber ducky installs itself also as a keyboard to the device, which makes it trusted. And um, it does not install itself as a mouse to the extent of the research of Parida anyway. It identifies itself as a keyboard and it also leaves a PID and VID on the device. It has a default PID and VID, um, which may be an indicator of compromise. However, the PID and VID of the OMG cable and also the rubber ducky are not reliable enough to determine anything um, or determine the correlation or the connection of their presence to the crime. Reason being, the VID and PID can also be altered making it um, useless to memorize or recognize or identify the, or, or store, you know, what the default PID or VID is. So an next thing may be useful because for a lay person using a device like that, they may not know that this kind of evidence is left behind. They just think, yeah, I got away with it. The CCTV camera did not pick me um, doing anything on the computer. So I got away with it. But a PID and VID may be left behind on the computer. And um, I'm going to talk about another side of using the rubber deculator, which is their use in virtual environments or you know in cloud environments, which I think is a potential research area for the future. Um, but yeah, we'll get to that very soon. But the PID and, v and the VID are not reliable enough to also tie them to the crime because they can be changed. And not just changed, the attacker can alter them to mimic a particular manufacturer and a particular device. So if I want the OMG cable or the rubber ducky to mimic a Microsoft keyboard or a Dell mouse, it's so easy to you know, spoof the PID and the VID to mimic that. And the system identifies it as a Dell keyboard or a Microsoft um, keyboard or a Microsoft mouse. So that makes the PID and VID also not reliable enough in detecting these devices. Um, time is running fast, so I'm gonna be quick. Also, the results of my experiment too, or even the first experiment as well, show an expert or a digital forensic analyst may not be able to reliably distinguish the um, actions carried out by any of these portable programmable devices and the actions carried out by a user or a suspect, which means there is potential for a miscarriage of justice when an innocent person is prosecuted for a crime they know nothing about. And um, this also indicates the, the need for more awareness on not just hardware attacks, but also other means through which um, you know, um, evidence could have been planted. And we're gonna see the teaching approach we use for some of our students um, here and um, how and why it's important for future or the next generation forensic analysts to adopt this habit from the university days and not just when they get to the future. Because like I also mentioned earlier, that work, their work doesn't just stop in the lab where they investigate evidence. They could literally determine someone's fate just from an error in the investigation phase. And they submit the report to the, you know, to the court or they come and defend what they've generated in the court, um, what, what they found rather in the court. And um, not knowing their, the impact their analysis and their conclusion could have on the case decision. So the teaching approach here we run as a seminar for final year students. The objective is to raise awareness on bias in investigation. And from the experiments I've carried out, we can see also if an analyst does not consider the possibility of this kind of device being responsible, it's very easy to think, yes, well, it doesn't look like any Trojan was present on your computer. It doesn't look like anybody else will, has access to your computer. So why are you saying you did not do this? How, how can you prove to us that you have not done this? But again, 
you can only investigate to the extent of your experience. As a forensic analyst, you can also investigate to the extent of your research. You cannot investigate beyond the level of the, of the beyond the level of the knowledge you have. So it's not just for hackers to know about these tools. It's not just for um, teachers to know about these tools, but forensic analysts, investigators, the police also need to know about these devices and several other means through which evidence could have been planted or could have been created you know, on a device so we can reduce the amount of miscarriages of justice taking place out there. And um, overview of the topic is given on hardware attacks in general. And um, as a proof of concept or demonstration, I use the OMG cable because that's easier to get audience participation. Uh, someone from the audience could literally just control the lecturer's computer from way back in the class. And um, that's, a, that's a very easy way to prove to them. You can control my computer and my computer is gonna receive the instructions as though um, the user is the one who is responsible for the instructions being sent. So the computer is gonna trust it. And also we talk about some real world cases where um, errors in digital forensics have led to you know, erroneous prosecution or erroneous punishments, uh, wrong punishments rather. And in addition, um, I also came up with this in a way to teach them about mitigating bias in investigations. So when they get out there, it's not just you know taking evidence at face value, but before I investigate, I need to consider different hypotheses. What are the possible scenarios? What are the things that could have happened? What are the things that could have led to this evidence being generated? Also, what are the possible actors? Basically, what are the possible um, devices or other people that may have been responsible for creating this evidence? And then what could be the possible aims of these attackers if, or possible aims of different scenarios, right? So this would help them not just investigate in a one-way approach, but considering several, excuse me, considering several possible um, scenarios, several possible actors, several possible aims. And they pick each of the hypotheses and investigate as a standalone um, they pick it as a standalone investigation, which makes them, you know, less biased because yes, I've picked the possibility that the user may be responsible. I investigate that down the path. I'm done with that. I pick the possibility that a hardware a hardware device may be responsible. Um, I investigate down the path. I pick the, I pick another possible hypothesis that you know um, a malware, a Trojan could have been responsible. I investigate down the path and so on and so on. But it all starts from generating as many hypotheses as possible. Now, um, we carried out some experiments a few weeks ago using um, a framework we are testing to you know, detect um, the use of hardware devices in carrying out unauthorized actions. And um, we got a, mixed, a, a mix of different people, of different levels of experience. And we found out that the people who had forensic knowledge and some level of ethical hacking knowledge were able to come up with much more reasonable hypotheses before they started the investigation, as opposed to forensic analysts or people who are just learning forensics but have no idea of you know, ethical hacking or ways to which hackers or attackers could have you know, carried out certain actions as well, or you know, tactics and tactics and techniques of attackers, which leads to me thinking that there is a need for forensic analysts to also go beyond just learning the, learning forensics, but also learning the means through which hackers and attackers can carry out operations, but not to waste too much time on this. Um, yeah, other factors that could lead to, yeah, I'm conscious of the time, other factors that could lead to errors um, in investigation. Um, I've mentioned bias, but also the assumption that computers do not make mistakes. We've all had computers work on Google, garbage in, garbage out, which means they are much more reliable, um, the evidence from them can be trusted. But as forensic analysts, we can't always accept or take the evidence generated on the computer as, um, you know, as to take it the way it is. We need to have a curious mind. We need to have an open mind. We need to have an inquisitive mind. We need to, you know, be critical thinkers when it comes to investigating because someone's life is could be at stake and the errors in your investigation does not stop are you working in the lab that conclusion that report could be the end of someone's life it could be the you know um continuation of a second chance for a criminal to go back to the streets and also continue um, harming other people which is not fair so the assumptions that computers not make mistakes and this is this can be very 
This is very obvious from the case of the post office scandal. For people who are not familiar with the post office scandal, you can read on the post office scandal where the, the UK post office workers, um, up to I think 700 plus, were prosecuted wrongly for fraud, only to discover later that it was the computer, the system they were using, the accounting system they were using that was actually faulty. And it was years later, up to more than five years later, I think up to seven years plus later, that this new evidence came to light about the erroneous um, conclusion drawn by forensics. But people have lost their, their lives. Some people died in the prison, some gave birth in the prison, some could not attend important or could not witness important events in their children's lives. All those years, even though new evidence have come to light, new evidence might have come to light to show they are innocent, they did not commit a crime. They can't get those years back. And this all started from erroneous forensic conclusions and led to wrongful um, prosecution or wrongful um, punishment for these people. No matter the amount of compensation they might get, it can't buy those years back. And um, yeah, I, I don't want to go too much into the post office scandal and all the impact it had on the victims. But you can read on the post office scandal, it's quite um, a popular one. And then biased investigation, especially confirmation bias. And this is very common when um, an analyst has received the evidence files to investigate, but the person who collected the evidence from the crime scene may have colored the thoughts of the analyst, you know, from what with what they found at the crime scene. So basically they've painted a picture um, in the subconscious of the analyst as to what they think about the crime scene and what they think about the suspect. So then the analyst goes on to investigate down that path of what the, you know, the person who collected the evidence from the crime scene might have told them. Now, the moment they find something that looks similar to what they've been told or the thoughts that have been colored, they think, yeah, I've hit the jackpot. I found it. They generate a report. And I also don't blame them. There are also other factors like um, tight schedule, which is very common with the police. I've spoken with some, with some policemen. I've spoken with some experts that have also um, taken contracts for to contract, that have been contracted with the police. Um, and they talk about tight schedule and how many cases they may have to finish within maybe eight hours or a couple of days and return. So they have to come up with something, right? But all these things are factors that could lead to wrongful um, or errors in investigation or digital forensic um, analysis. There's also tunnel vision and pride. And a very good example of this, which I'm gonna give is, um, I, there was a student that we, we normally conduct expert witness exercises um, at, here at, at Greenwich for students. They investigate um, evidence files and then they, they come to a mock court, a mock um, yeah, court exercise where they present their evidence and they defend what they found. So um, there was this guy, one of the students, he submitted his report and um, he was graded and all. Then later on during the summer of that year, by the way, he got his results and everything already, during the summer of that year, we were just talking about um, forensics. I was in the lab working on my experiment. And we were talking and it was like, oh yeah, he actually discovered um, the morning of the, of the court exercise that he came up with the wrong conclusion and he found evidence that could have shown the suspect was actually not guilty. But it was like, no, he couldn't change his report that morning because he needed his grades and he couldn't start afresh, you know, writing his report. And um, that triggered, um, thoughts of other articles I've read about, you know, um, expert witnesses and pride. The moment they they pick a side, they are they are expected of themselves because of their sense of pride to stick to that side because they can't be seen as making mistakes. But the the mistake you made could lead to wrong um, case decision. You're supposed to, regardless of the time, come up, even if it's too late, let them know. I found additional evidence that could have, you know, that shows otherwise, or that shows something different from the conclusion I have drawn. So this is something called tunnel vision, where, you know, the student also needed this grade. In the real world, it may be the money that the analyst needs. It may be the time they don't have. It may be their reputation as well. Like, I can't be seen or caught making mistakes. So all these things are things we need to also let them know. It's not just about your grades. It's not just about you getting um, high scores, but we need to inculcate or you know add or adopt the culture of 
saying the right thing, telling the right story. If you find something else that shows otherwise, you should have integrity as a forensic analyst to come up and stand, you know, hands up and say, I found something else that showed otherwise, I might have made a mistake in my previous conclusion. Um, yeah, so those these are other factors that could lead to um, errors in um, analysis and errors in expert witness ex um, testimony in court and also ultimately errors in the case decision. Um, because of time, I would not, I would, I'm gonna rush through the rest so like we can have some minutes for questions. So um, there is also something called the Trojan Horse Defense, which is another potential risk of, of devices like this, the portable programming devices. Trojan Horse Defense is basically when um, someone claims they don't know how, maybe a child content, illegal child content um, got to their system and they claim that a Trojan may have been responsible for it. And the Trojan Horse Defense um, to an extent has been received as a valid um, excuse for certain illegal content. And there are cases that have been acquitted because the suspect claimed a Trojan may have done it. And um, it's a risky one because then these devices, like the portable program devices, like the um, Robert Key, the OMG cable, may then become the next generation Trojan horses in the sense that users or guilty people may start blaming these devices as responsible. So another, the downside of awareness on these devices is that when actual guilty people are, are found, they can, they can start to claim that the OMG cable may have done it. It is very possible for the OMG cable to be responsible. I think somebody else may have planted a robot that my device to download this child content. It wasn't me. So which is a downside to the awareness of the devices or to the availability or, you know, the presence of these devices. So they may become the next generation Trojan forces to be receiving the blame when the suspect has actually committed a crime. And um, the screen crime, like I mentioned, um, is not considered a hit because it's, it uses the HDMI interface. So um, they, I use the HDMI here for reconnaissance. So if you recall from the first set of slides I showed, I showed the three phases an attacker would need to pass through before they can successfully launch an attack, which is reconnaissance, exploit development, and the uh, attack itself, which is the delivery and retrieval of the device. So here I use the, the screen crowd for reconnaissance. And um, I'm not gonna talk too much about this uh, because of time. If you have questions about it, please feel free to ask by all means, I would answer it. But yeah, I use the reconnaissance to gather information about the target, the window size, the, the, top, the location of the file, etc. And then I use the OMG cable to actually launch the file tampering attack. So the thing about the screen crab is because it doesn't use it, um, it doesn't use USB, it uses HDMI. There is no evidence left on the device. It works as a splitter. I tried reverse connecting this device on, on a live system before investigating again on a um, using dead forensics on a forensic software. And I, I discovered that um, the, the computer was detecting only the screen on the other end. So this, the screen crab sits between the, the, the device the system unit, um, if you can see my cursor, the system unit and the external display. It can also work on laptops, um, especially laptops that need, where the user wants to use an external display or something. But it can capture information um, that passes through the HDMI without any difference being noticed on the um, external display. So um, everything looks okay to the user on the other end. There is no loss in quality. It, it is very storage efficient. For my experiments, which I carried out for more than a month, I used about 30, I used a 32 gig SD card um, to store because I did not want to use the network feature. It can also work wirelessly, by the way, and send um, the captured information to a C2 server or a command and control server. Um, but I decided to go offline because I wanted to make it as clean and as neat as possible. So um, for the length of my experiment, the, the screen crop did not use up to one gig of 32 gig. So imagine how long it can actually capture for. And the quality of the videos are actually clear enough. I'm gonna show an example now. I can come back to this slide if there is a need, but because of time, I'm gonna to move to the next. But one other thing we should note about the screen crab is, it's not just a device that you can use for reconnaissance and that's it. It can also be used for a standalone attack of data theft or data information retrieval or um, espionage. 
And um, among the risks, potential risk of devices like this is the suspect, a suspect may be charged with a breach of the Official Secrets Act or even charged with informational treason if the screen card was used to capture or collect sensitive information or top secret information or information related to national security, where they, they think the user may have, may have been responsible for it. And the forensic analyst comes to the computer and discovers there is no other trace. Nobody else has access to a system. So if there is nobody else who, if nobody else has access to your system, how come you're saying you did not re reveal the sensitive information? But because this guy does not leave any traces on the system, um, it works as a HDMI splitter, just passed through by captured information in the process. The forensic analyst is, is not going to find anything. And even if they do, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't blame them if they don't find anything because they may not even be looking for this device in the first place. They may not even think to check the possibility of this device in the first place, which leads back to, again, considering different hypotheses, different possible scenarios, different possible actors, and the possible aims, which I mentioned earlier and I drew up um, together. So it is not your typical man in the middle attack. It can work without um, network connection. And I've, I've got a paper um, written for this with the abstract accepted into a conference, which is called, oops, yeah, I've got very few minutes now. Yeah, which, which is called um, an offline adversary in the middle of attack used to carry out, you know, um, a cyber enabled crime. But yeah, because time is fast spent, um, this was meant to be an exercise, but I'm just going to move on and take questions. And the, the point, the reason I put this was to show how the screen cap can also be used on touch screen systems to capture even logon passwords where you don't need to hack, um, hack the system, you don't need to brute force anymore, you don't need to guess because the screen cap captures that information for you. I'm not gonna play that video now because of time, but it shows certain, several information that you can use to launch an actual attack. And um, yeah, again, in conclusion, before you start your investigation as analysts or potential um, analysts, um, consider this chart that here, you should also encourage students to always have this at the back of your mind. Before you start your investigation, before you draw your conclusion, Consider possible hypotheses. Under the hypothesis, what could be the possible scenarios? What could be the possible actors? What could be the possible aims? Now, in this case, we've used a hardware device, but it could be any other means or any other um, actor responsible. It could be any other scenario. The aim could be anything. So this should be considered before investigation is started and also before drawing conclusions to enable an unbiased investigation within context as much as possible. <laughs>